Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let everyone that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Oh, come on, you can do a little bit better than that. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is indeed a good and pleasant thing when the beloved gather together in unity. Good to see you, Mother Barbara. Glad to have you in the building today. I'm Jay Williams, lead pastor of the Union Combined Parish. Um, we gather here in our historic South End Sanctuary and at the same time at our other historic sanctuary in the West End, our Old West congregation is gathered. And of course, whoever you are, wherever you are, we have dozens of people online, dozens of people in this place. Whoever you are, wherever you are, sanctuary is. Which is to say we invite you uh, to just inhale the spirit of God that dwells within this place, that dwells within you and uh, the safety and comforts of your homes as you travel, as you do various things. We are glad that you are here. If it's your first time here at Union, if you come here every week, or if it's your first time in a long time, we say to one and to all, welcome home. Here at Union, we live into the values of unconditional love, Christ's gospel of liberation, and we are just delighted by the opportunity to gather, particularly on this Juneteenth Sunday, or the day when we celebrate the freedom that black people have experienced uh, in this country. We'll say much more about that as we lift up Freedom Day as a way of thinking about who it is we are as the people called Methodists, as Christians who proclaim Christ's liberation indeed. Amen? Amen. As we gather uh, on this day, we gather surely holding the pain and the brokenness uh, that is near, perhaps in our families, in relationships, on the job, of course, we continue to pray and yearn for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza as there's brokenness and war and rumors of war and the land that we call holy. And we know that so many don't experience that peace as their homes are bombed and displaced. So we continue to pray and to lean in. And even as we hold the sadness that continues to surround us in this world, because indeed, to be sure, Juneteenth is a day of celebration and a day of lament. And we'll say more about that uh, during our teaching and in the litany. But we also come on this day rejoicing and giving thanks because a lot is happening and a lot has happened in our midst. At least a, a 10 or a dozen Unionites participated in the New England Annual Conference uh, this past week, which is the annual gathering of the 550 United Methodist churches in the six states of New England. Um, and uh, we had a wonderful time. And I'm just going to be upfront with y'all because the, those of us who were there for these last four days, it was a long four days and we's tired, Lord. Uh, but yet we still celebrate all the good things that happened. We celebrated the historic general conference, of course, that removed all of the restrictive language against uh, queer people. So we continue to celebrate in this place. This month, and, and Pastor Kyle preached last week, Pastor Nikki preaches this week as we continue uh, to lean into the goodness of June, of pride, of all that is holy within us. Let me just give you a couple other highlights from annual conference. We established, uh, appropriate for this time of celebration for Juneteenth, a reparations fund that will fund historically black churches in the New England conference with a seed funding of $1 million and, and more to come. So we thank God for and of course that continues our work from last year, the Jubilee resolution that, that eliminated conference debt, uh, property insurance debt uh, uh, for historically black churches. We also added a immigrant clergy support fund. Uh, to support those who uh, come to the United States and are serving within our bounds in the immigration process. 
you should know that Union, our combined parish, received one of the One Church Matters Awards. So we got an award, y'all, uh, for the work that we are doing in this place. Uh, particularly uh, celebrating the 16 new members that we received last year. So we th give thanks. I see you, Sharon, uh, was with us at the annual conference and came on stage uh, for that moment. And where is our certified candidate, Solomon? Solomon, come on down. Come, walk down this middle aisle. So of course Solomon, Solomon came to Union as a student at Boston University School of Theology, has been our contextual education uh, student and, and many other things. He was certified as a candidate officially for ordination in the United Methodist Church in May. And yesterday at the annual conference, he was licensed as a local pastor. At, so he's officially clergy in the United Methodist Church. So, I'm being taxed to say a word. <laughs> um, I just really want to say thank you so much um, yeah, for the family that I have here. I know it's been, um, it's always been a difficult thing for immigrants to find themselves elsewhere. And like, it's been so much of anxiety of like getting to think about where to turn whenever there is issue outside home and I'm grateful, I'm very um, like I'm excited that God brought me here um, to Union and Union has been my, my family from, from day one and thank you so much for your love, for your care, your concern and everything that you've, you've given to me. God bless you. As Pastor Kyle uh, comes to join me, we also have to celebrate, uh, and I invite you to stand up one more time. We wanna celebrate, so Lola is on Pro Presenter, uh, but Lola is now engaged to Edmund, and we celebrate their engagement. Come on, stand on your feet and bless God for them as well, for the love and the joy and the peace that is in this place. Love is love is love, and we're just delighted for you and Edmund as you begin this new journey together, Lola. Pastor Kyle. Good morning, beloved church. It's great to be here with you, and they say that one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy, and I feel so much joy today because part of my extended family is here in the house. If you're in building, you'll see a large group of young people that are here, and this is the senior high youth group from Sun Creek United Methodist Church in Allen, Texas. So let's give God a hand clap of praise. Sun Creek is where I uh, was formed, uh, where I was confirmed, where I had my call to ministry nurtured. I was in the youth group and the praise band and the youth choir. And this is a, it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful community. And they've always had my heart, even as I've been here in Boston. I've gone back, they've supported me in my ministry, even here. And it's just such a joy to have them here, to get to be serving this week on a mission trip. Um, it's, it's always amazing when young people give part of their summer to serve other people, to be in fellowship with one another, and to grow in their faith of God. So we give God uh, a praise for that. And I'd love to introduce uh, Pastor Barry and Kimmy Kramer, uh, who are representing the group. Uh, pastor Barry is the lead pastor at Sun Creek, and just want to give him a chance to say a few words of greeting. Uh, yeah, so let's give them a warm union welcome. Well, I'm obviously the one person that's not a young person in this group from Allen, Texas. 
but uh, I bring greetings from our congregation that is worshiping right now in our service uh, back in Texas, and we are thrilled to be here. Kyle is one of our uh, pride and joys from our church, and uh, our whole congregation is excited about us being able to come and be here today. And I want to say one of the things I'm excited about, our church is just 27 years old, and we're here to learn from you this week because we hope in 200 years to still be as vital and making a difference in the world the way you are at Union. So teach us everything you can this week. This is Kimmy Kramer, who's in charge of this uh, mission trip. I want her to say a few words. Well, thank you for welcoming us, uh, Pastor Kyle, Pastor Sarah, and Pastor Jay. It is a pleasure to be here and a joy, and we can't wait to serve this community and learn and, and grow. Um, we have a lot of really excited young people who are ready to get their hands dirty and to love on people and do whatever we're called to do. And that example was set by you back at Sun Creek. And so we want to live into that. So thank you for having us. So beloved, as we continue in worship on this day, The joy that we have in our hearts is mixed with the heaviness and the solemnity of Juneteenth. So I invite you to find yourselves grounded. Maybe your feet are squarely on the floor and your shoulders are squared so you can breathe fully and deeply. As we celebrate this litany, this grounding moment, it comes to us from black liturgies, prayers, poems, and meditations for staying human by Cole Arthur Riley. It's a part of it that will be read in response as we invoke our ancestors, the freedom fighters, those who went on before us, enslaved Africans, but always free in heart. Dr. Toni Morrison says, freeing yourself was one thing. Claiming ownership of that freed self was another. So from Cole Riley, dreaming, we pray God of broken chains. On this day we remember we do not know how it felt when the word of freedom came, what release was felt in the bodies of those who made us. What disbelief, what joy, what sorrow, but would you allow some of echo of it to resound in our bodies today? We gather not just to honor freedom rung, but in protection and continuation of it. Let it resound clearly as we join voices on this day. We pray peace and deep rest for our ancestors, those who labored without agency over their bodies for generations, and those who chose the sea. Holding memory, we proclaim, we will not be owned. We marvel at the dreamers, those who clung to an imagination for liberation regained those who fought, strategized, organized, holding memory, we proclaim. We, will. we thank you for those who became our own historians, who preserved culture in whispers by moonlight, transmitting song and name, holding memory, we proclaim. We grieve for the brutality of families alienated from one another, the daughter ripped from her mother's breast, sister torn from brother, and we honor all the ways our people formed new familial bonds, rising to nurture children and impart tenderness on those the oppressor sought to harden. Strengthen our bonds now that the invisible threads stretching back 
between each holy black soul will be fortified by compassion and intergenerational healing. Holding their memory, we proclaim. We will not God, we pause for every body broken, bruised, and lynched. There are stories that reside in our bodies, both known and unknown to us. Keep us near to our own flesh, that we would protect one another from the brutality of white capitalism. May the rest and care that were denied to our ancestors be found in us today. Holding memory, we proclaim. And this joy in us, this durable, defiant joy, would you shield it, O oh God, from the mouth of despair? Remind us there is no void that can match the strength of our collective hope. Keep our songs alive, each verse, every dance. May our humor survive as we play and laugh. Show us the many faces of joy that all who dare encounter it will find themselves at home. Holding memory, we proclaim. We will not be now may the same God who spoke to Harriet make the sound of liberation clear as night to us. May the divine hold us in the same holy darkness that protected our ancestors on the journey. And we remember, may, the shield, may they shield us from despair, knowing that our story is more than pain. Knowing that our story is more than pain. Knowing that our story is so much more than pain. Ours is the story of dignity. Let us reclaim it. Ashe, Ashe, and Ashe. As our praise team comes and we prepare to sing freedom and joy, Ashe is that ancestral cry from West Africa that means amen, that means so be it. So if you agree with that prayer that, that, that joy and freedom is our destiny, it is our heritage, and it lives within us, somebody ought to say Ashe and amen. If you believe that joy is in this place on this morning, somebody ought to put their hands together and bless God. And if you know that there is freedom in this place, somebody stand on your feet. Let's sing, let's rejoice, let's dance. I wanna clap a little louder than before. I wanna sing a little louder than before. I gotta scream higher than before. I gotta shout louder than before. Clap a little louder than before. I want to sing a little louder than before. I want to jump higher than before. I got to shout louder than before. than before. 
No more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. Oh, say it with me now. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. One more time, one more time. No more shackles, no more chains. No more bondage, I am free, yeah. If you believe it, say hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Deep in my soul, deep in my soul. 
true love instead of pain this freedom though you've captured me and I've got joy instead of mourning cause you give me joy down deep in my soul down deep in my soul down deep in my soul oh Joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my What a calm, what a feeling of peace and joy and love that we might be feeling right now in this, in this place. We bless the name of the Lord this morning as we gathered here to say the Lord is good and all the time. <laughs> I really want to invite you as we pray this morning. Indeed, you are mighty, you are good, and you are merciful. We praise your name, we give you glory, we give you honor. We say you are Lord, you are King, and there is none to be compared unto thee. We look at the north, the south, the east, the west, and we say your name is I am that I am. You are the Lord that say yes, no one says no. King of kings, Lord of lords, and God of gods. We invite you, we invite your presence, we seek your presence, precious Holy Spirit. Descend. Speak to our heart. Speak to our mind. Come and make your abode in and among us this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to have to be in your presence, to receive your everlasting word. We commit the preacher into your care. 
We ask you, O oh God, to anoint them. We ask you, O oh God, to speak through them. Let us receive your word, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We mute every action, every inaction of the enemy against us. We command the oppressor to be silenced. Any voice of injustice, any voice of oppression, in the mighty name of Jesus. We commit our young folks among us into your care. We ask you that you continue to speak to them. Be the light on their path. Be the lamp, O oh God, on their feet in the name of Jesus. As they seek your name, as they seek you, we pray that you will let them find you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Give a hand clap of praise to God, you know. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today, church. Today, our scripture comes from the Psalms, which are a song, ancient, that was sung in worship, and we read them here today. So I'll be reading Psalm 9, 9 through 20, and invite you to read along with me. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare their deeds among the people. For they who avenge blood is mindful of them. They do not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord. See what I suffer for those who hate me. You are the one who lifts me up from the gates of death, so that I may recount all of your praises. In the gates of daughter Zion, rejoice in your deliverance. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net they hid as their own foot been, as, as their own foot been caught. The Lord made himself known they had executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the works of their own hands. The wicked shall depart to Sheol, all nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. Rise up, O Lord. Do not let mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are only human. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Beloved, as we prepare for the preach word and the sung word, I'm grateful for the way in which technology greets us here at Union and allows us to be a hybrid community, about 60 people online currently, uh, and the way in which, uh, even as we gather in the building, we're able to talk back using technology. So if you're in the building, you can actually connect to the Zoom because a sermon is preached here and a sermon lives here in the congregation. So we're able to speak. Just don't connect the audio when you connect to Zoom in this place today, of course. And one of the ways in which we use technology during this month of June is to have a bit of a teach-in. Whereas we lean into the power of pride and have been engaged in the pride series this month on the first Sunday of June, we use the teaching moment to talk about pride, the, pride, the history of the pride march as we prepared for the pride march. And then we, on week two, we took it to the history of, of queerness in the Harlem Renaissance and the ways in which black liberation and queer liberation were in, interwoven during uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Last week, we pivoted in preparation for our time of Juneteenth and thought historically about the meaning of Juneteenth as we prepared for Freedom Day, which of course was on Wednesday. Today, we want to, to, to lean in and learn a little bit about Opal Lee, who is known as the grandmother of Juneteenth. 
She's an elder 97 years young and still fighting for justice. And she played a very pivotal role in the making of Juneteenth a national federal holiday. So let's turn uh, to this teach-in moment. And if you will, put your hands together as we learn.
Cause I got me some angels angels watching over me all Yes sir All around me so All around me To the God in whom we trust, we ask that your Holy Spirit might fall upon us now, might speak a word to that which is wordless, might move us forward, might open our hearts, might open our ears, our eyes, our mind to exactly what it is that you're up to. We pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ and let all God's people say amen, amen, and amen. Beloved, as I begin this morning, I want to make the locus of this morning's sermon as clear as I possibly can. We cannot adequately participate in or engage the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ if we are not talking about politics. When I say politics, I'm not talking about endorsing a particular candidate for office or choosing the right political party. When I say politics, I mean the ways in which this world attempts to govern us, to manage human society, to allocate essential resources, to acknowledge the very real and lived experience of its citizens, and to move or not move to affirm the sacred worth and dignity of all of God's people. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ in 2024 is an inherently political act. Because from the very beginning, to be a follower of Christ was to move in opposition to Roman rule and authority. See, how can I preach the gospel of life, death, and resurrection if I don't name the political truth of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection? If I don't name how the power of God for us here on earth, how do I name it? If I make Jesus out to be some ghostly figure who floated above the very real and pressing problems of this world, if I make Jesus to be some warm ball of light who exists only to affirm you and your needs, to bring you comfort and nothing else. How else do I preach the gospel when it is written in Matthew chapter two that King Herod caught whiff of a prophecy of God's, a prophecy that claimed the savior of the world was coming not to uphold the powers of the day, but to challenge them. A prophecy that claimed this prince of peace would be born right under King Herod's political domain. How in a bid to protect his own power and governance, this king sent out an official decree that all children born in and around Bethlehem shall be killed in order to wipe this savior right off the map, which is to say he legislated 
made a policy out of the death of hundreds of thousands of innocent people. How can I preach a non-political gospel? When Jesus' life and ministry caught the attention of the masses, yes, but also caught the scorn of political leaders of his day, of the Roman authorities and the religious leaders who understood that this kingdom of heaven that Jesus claimed was coming, that's not going to be the kingdom that they ruled. How do I keep the political out of it? When the death of Jesus was the result of a politician's ruling, state-sanctioned violence, his execution a tool of empire designed to keep its citizens in line. How can I be expected to teach us to sing like the psalmists, who speak about being dominated by a nation that refuses to love them, who claim the reign of God regardless, who speak of the Lord not as a divine arbiter of entrance into heaven, but as a stronghold for the oppressed in times of trouble. Psalm 9 verse 15 reads, the nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they hid, has their own foot been caught? It's like when a nation cries, freedom, freedom, liberty for all. And then when all seek liberty and freedom, they cry persecution and oppression. In the net that they hid, has their own foot been caught? And so, no, there is no shame in this gospel that is intimately attuned to the horrors of this world. Because Christ hath spoken, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to bring the good news to the poor to proclaim the release to captives, recovery of sight to those without vision, and to set free those who are oppressed. Oh, remember, beloved, that the murder of our Savior was perfectly legal because they used government to justify nailing him to the cross, because his resurrection did not just claim some abstract victory over death, but spoke back to a nation and a world that you cannot kill the spirit of this liberating God. You cannot lay claim to what God said God would do. You cannot bury what God has called holy. There is no shame in this gospel because this gospel still speaks. Because right now, 19 states have laws restricting gender-affirming care. Some with the possibility of felony charges for being trans or providing health care to trans people. And still, trans joy abounds. And still, trans and gender non-conforming folks are here. And still, legislating one's body out of existence will never make it so. We are the good and saving news of Jesus Christ anywhere we claim life in that which the world wants to die. We cry holy, 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 where they say it's blasphemy. We sing praises to God where they call us godless. We bring sanctuary to those people they try to send back where they came from, build holy rivers where they keep us thirsty. And listen, I won't let it slip away that on this Sunday following Juneteenth, there are self-professed Christians and their clergy who will say with earnest tears in their eyes, why does everything have to be so political? Why does everything always have to be about race? Why are we making this all so complicated? And when, oh when, can we get back to talking about the saving power of Jesus Christ? All the while, missing the absolute irony that we cannot talk about the saving power of Christ unless we name what it is that we are being saved from. How can I preach what it means to follow Jesus and live a righteous, godly life if I do not acknowledge that once upon a time, some 250 odd years ago, white European Christians engendered the institution of slavery 
not because they weren't following their religion, but because they convinced themselves and others that their religion afforded them a manifest destiny to spread outward and possess whole continents of land and people, that their nation, this nation, had a divine right to own, name, and claim anything it willed, including people. People who would not be in relationship with them, but subject to them who would live to be served by them in what would be called a divine obedience of slave to master, who would hold scriptures in one hand and the chains of someone else in another, who would make of this a religio-political system that would require specific political aims to untangle it, who helped to imbue the very fabric of Christian faith with distorted notions of what the people of God can and cannot do, who we get to call worthy, what we can call our dominion, where we can make our claims on how people can and cannot move in this world. Listen, you've seen headlines and get ready to see more as we approach November. Christian nationalism is not just some pithy phrase designed to categorize the religious right. Christian nationalism is the legacy of white Christian enslavers. It proclaims that anything that isn't like me and mine is a threat to my being, my Christianity, my Jesus, my God. You'll hear it when folks decry the lack of prayer in public schools or how the moral deficit of books on race, gender, and sexuality exists, the rules over how history gets taught, and what we're allowed to say about the legacy of chattel slavery and the birth of the United States, not to mention the attacks on critical race theory, because what's the point of all that race talk when it is written, there is neither slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus? So when it is decided that the Ten Commandments will be posted in every public classroom in Louisiana, we take it as not just some consequence of evangelical Christian leadership, but as a concerted effort to reclaim dominion over who shall be called right and divine and who shall be subject to them. And don't worry, I hear it. I hear the tendency to say, oh, but that's not me. That's not my church. We don't go around believing and, and forcing those kinds of things on other, other people. Me and my church and, and my Christianity, we believe in loving everyone and including everyone. But the problem with that logic, beloved, is that your church, your Christianity, it's not what is dictating the dominant narrative about who God is and who God is not. Your Christianity and faith is not what sits in the halls of Congress or writes up backwards legislation regarding the fundamental human rights of God's people. But the world does not know and will not know unless you tell them. To feel complacent at this time of absolute spiritual and religious rot is like renovating the interior rooms of an abandoned spooky house and then wondering why people still don't want to come visit you. <laughs> because despite your work and renovations on the inside, to those on the outside, it still just looks like another dusty, crusty house. You know, I know some folks can feel uncomfortable with the pride flags waving proudly outside of the doors of this church. Because why should we be so flashy? We know who we are. We shouldn't have to prove it. But the satisfaction we have with the nature of our beliefs is not enough to signal safety and belonging to the traumatized and brokenhearted. The knowledge we have of our own liberative bend is not enough to liberate. So hear me when I say that in the same way that capital C Christianity has become equated with something like homophobia, 
As Christian nationalism continues to trend and spread, this world will start to see ever more its equation with white supremacy. This world will start to see its equation with ruling over, with the power to dictate what can and cannot be called good. And so, yes, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Jesus who came to liberate us from death's captivity in 2024, is an inherently political act. Because anywhere that we claim life, anywhere we claim love, anywhere we claim the spirit of the living God, threatens the capital C Christianity this world has come to know and love. Anytime we preach the gospel, those dominant powers hell-bent on distorting it, on dismantling our right to life and life abundant piece by piece, they quake with fear that God will not allow them to have the last word. The psalmists sing it like this, beloved, put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know they are only human. You see, there's a reason why we sing in this church. And it's not just so that we might praise God, but so that this world might finally hear us. That the powers that be and the people who try to tell us who we are might know they are only human. They are only dust. But God is the one who raises from the dust a people and a presence that will bring forth a loving, abundant kingdom of God. That our God is, is not the God of white European enslavers. Our God is the God who breaks every chain. Our God is not the God who sends our stories, our desires, our hopes to the tomb. Our God is the God who reaches into what they try to kill and pulls out new life. Our God is not the God of red, white, and blue. Our God is the God who casts a rainbow of living color in any place the people need a sign. A sign that life abounds and that God is not finished with us yet. So will you take with me this morning an obnoxious pride in the gospel? Can you sing as the psalmists do? Can you confidently proclaim who God is and who God is not? Can you sing like the psalmists who cry that the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed? Who sing that when they damn us to hell, God is the one who lifts us up from the gates of death? Who shout, put fear in them, O oh God. Let the nations know they're only human. Can you sing as though the world will hear with the knowledge and the confidence of who God is and what God is able to do? Can you believe this morning that your voice, your advocacy, your out and loud presence in this world is the salvific song of God? If you do, if you can, then I ask, I pray that you sing with pride this morning. Thanks be to God. May it be so. Amen.
Praise God. Praise God for the Union Ensemble and the band. Beloved, the invitation to discipleship has already been laid before us. Will you sing? Will you sing proudly the song of our gospel? Will you sing a song with a sweet melody that invites all to the table? Will you sing a sweet melody of love that will heal and bind up the broken hearts? Will you sing that song of freedom that opens our hearts, that releases the chains of shame, and yes, liberates us from systemic oppression? That is the invitation to discipleship this morning, beloved. And of course, we know that we can't do this work together, that we need a church family, a church home to support us, to remind us who we are, to practice freedom together. So the second invitation is this. If you're looking for a church home, a place where you can be loved into freedom, union might just be that place for you. So we invite you to go to unionboston.org join or talk to any of the pastors on the staff. And we would love to talk to you about what it means to join formally in membership in this place. Or if you just want to know a little bit more about what's going on, we'd love to talk to you about that too. Because there are lots of connection groups, opportunities this summer to be in fellowship and to grow in our faith. So beloved, the doors of the church are open. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? I'd like to invite Minister JJ up for our offering this morning. I wasn't expecting that. Beloved, would you put your hands together? It is time for the offering. Yeah. We give thanks to God and we clap because God is good. Even when we can't see it, God is good. Even when we don't feel it, God is good. Beloved, there are four ways to give here at Union. You can go to unionboston.org slash give, or you can give on the Union Church Boston app. You can text any dollar amount to 84321. You can send us a check right here to 485 Columbus Avenue, or if you feel like getting up and showing us the joy that you have this morning, you can walk down to the back and put an offering in the box in the back. Beloved, it is time for the offering.
And so we stand and sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, alleluia, alleluia. may be seated. As you are seated, we catch our breath again. Uh, first, give it up for Brian. He played that fiddle. <laughs> and give a shout out to his mom. Brian's mom is here. Just wave. Yes. <laughs> and listen, it is the summertime. Officially, the solstice has happened, but it was cooler when we began this morning. <laughs> but now it's hot, <laughs> of course, because the temperature as the time goes on increases, but I think it's because Reverend Nikki Renee brought the fire. <laughs> I was on one of my, the group chats, and actually none of us was really expecting that in so far as that first sentence, right? And this, this, this sermon is about politics and just actually a, a really wonderful, delightful a way to celebrate Juneteenth in the context of this Pride Month uh, that we might go out with an obnoxious type of pride in the gospel the type that frees us as we are tied together intersectionally. And none of us are free until all of us are free. Yes. My God today, thank you. So today after church, we will celebrate, continue to celebrate Juneteenth uh, at the Harriet Tubman Park Memorial. There's a ceremony that begins at 1.30 p.m. It's an annual celebration that is sponsored by the Consulate of Canada, indeed because Mother Harriet uh, journeyed so many hundreds of enslaved uh, Africans uh, from here, from the South, into freedom in Canada. Uh, so uh, our annual uh, commemoration, community comm commemoration, sponsored by the Friends of Harriet Tubman Park and the Consulate of Canada will begin at 1.30 at the monument, and then it will continue a brief ceremony outdoors and then return to continue the conversation in the chapel in the connection room. Amen. Uh, beloved, on next Sunday, June the 30th, we have the opportunity to celebrate uh, first of our baptisms for this summer, uh, the granddaughter of Sharon and uh, Pastor Dave Jackson will be with us. So we're excited about the opportunity uh, to, as we conclude Pride Month, uh, to gather around baptismal font and be reminded that God indeed is proud of us from the very beginning because we are created in God's image and get to claim that joy together. And then the following Sunday on July the 7th, it's gonna be the first Sunday in July, which is our new member Sunday. Put your hands together for the new members who are planning to join us. Um, it is also our first Sunday ritual now as we are a combined parish, one church, four locations that we would gather on the first Sunday together gather around table, so it'll be a wonderful time indeed. And starting on July 7th, following worship, every first Sunday of the month, we'll have a community meal together. Uh, some have uh, expressed that, you know, with all of the growth, with all the locations, with all of the change that is happening, uh, we need to just slow down and break bread and gather without an agenda except to get to know one another. 
Uh, so actually, the, um, we received a grant from Boston University School of Theology in partnership with Lilly uh, Foundation. It's a $30,000 Creative Callings grant. Uh, part of that funding is allowing us to just pay for meals. Uh, to pay for food here on Sundays, so the first Sundays, as well as in our three intentional communities, at the, the 20 students that, that live in our uh, intentional communities will also be able to gather for meals together. Minister Solomon will be coordinating this in his role of radical hospitality, so we're just delighted. So mark your calendars, next Sunday of baptism, and then the first Sunday of July, and every first Sunday we'll gather combined worship and a community meal following worship. Put your hands together. We'll continue um, uh, in celebrating in the final week of Pride Month next week, this series on loving that all that is holy. Summer at Union, unionboston.org forward slash summer in July and August and in September. We go to the next slide. Uh, July, August, and September, we've, got, we've curated a series of opportunities for us to gather from uh, the Boston Gospel Fest to Fellowship at Fenway. Details will be provided on next week's Fellowship at Fenway, the, the ballpark, uh, July 14th, many other uh, things. If you've got ideas, send them in to office at unionboston.org, but go ahead to unionboston.org forward slash summer as we recreate, as we recreate, connect, and serve. Um, let's skip to the connection groups uh, slide. There's many ways, connection groups uh, made for you, many ways. We can only do so much in the 90 minutes on Sunday here, so there's many opportunities. Scan the QR code, unionboston.org forward slash groups for us to go deeper in our faith, go deeper in our service, go deeper in our connection with one another. One of those service opportunities every Saturday at Old West in the West End our food forest, uh, there's an opportunity to serve. We've created a, a food producing garden forest on the front lawn of no longer a lawn, is now a forest. Converted the front lawn into a food forest at Old West. You're invited to indeed uh, roll up your sleeves and uh, get to work because our, our friends from Sun Creek are gonna get to work this week. Give it your hands, uh, put your hands together one more time for our friends from Sun Creek. As we conclude this worship and go out to serve, you're invited. Because what a day it has been. And we would be remiss if we did not conclude, uh, culminate our celebration of Juneteenth uh, without, it would be remiss if we did not sing the Black National Anthem. When James Weldon Johnson and his brother Rosman in 1900 had a group of school children perform uh, this in Florida, commemorating the birth of President Lincoln uh, in the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. Uh, they could not have imagined that this song would continue to be sung as a powerful story, as a powerful testament of struggle, of pain, and of liberation. That the God of our weary years and the God of our silent tears leads us into the light. So you're invited to take a posture of reverence, which is to say every time we hear, lift every voice and sing, you're invited to stand, I invite you to stand. 519 in the hymnal, the words will also be on screen. Let us sing.
beloved, receive this benediction. You are not a haunted house. You are clothed in living color. So live out loud and live obnoxiously proud. And now may the love of God, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always until we meet God face to face. Amen. Amen.